Loving God, teach us how to live in an uncertain world as we wait for the coming of your kingdom. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, friends. If you've ever wondered what the thesis statement of the Gospels is, maybe of the whole New Testament, I submit to you that Jesus' words in our Gospel reading this morning is it. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is Jesus' central message, that time is up, on all of the failed kingdoms and empires of this world, which have brought nothing but misery and fear for the vast majority of humanity. Starting now, the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God. This is Jesus' shorthand for the way the world would be if God's dream for the world were fulfilled. If God got what God wanted, we would live in a world where abundance replaces scarcity, where anxiety gives way to trust, where the myth of earning becomes the truth of belonging. Down with the lies of empire, empire can no longer oppress us. Empire says that the only way the world can work is for the weak to dominate the strong, for the strong to dominate the weak and the rich to dominate the poor. Jesus liberates us from those lies and empowers us to build a world of justice, equality, and peace for all people. The kingdom of God is at hand, is indeed good news, but not for everyone. It's a subversive gospel because it's a direct attack on the empire of Jesus' day. For if God is king, then Caesar is not. And that means that Pilate, Caesar's appointed governor of Judea, is illegitimate. And so are the Jewish elites, who survived by collaborating with and paying tribute to Rome, not just Herod, Rome's puppet provincial king, but also the temple priests who bought off the Romans with money from the temple treasury. The hope for God's kingdom is embedded in the prayer Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. The first petition of that prayer your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. This is our eternal cry for God's justice to come down into the here and now, into the world that we live in today. Jesus calls us to follow him on the way into God's kingdom now. And what is God's kingdom like? Mark shows us this over the course of his gospel through Jesus' actions and the parables that Jesus tells throughout his ministry. But I think we can see a glimpse of God's kingdom most clearly when Mark relates the story of the feeding of the 5,000, that miracle story that forms the centerpiece of Mark's gospel. Putting the most important story in the middle of a text was a common literary technique in the ancient world, by the way, and then from that centerpiece, waves would ripple out in both directions. In fact, there's a ripple from that story that connects to our reading today. Did you notice the first sentence of today's gospel after John was arrested? Mark doesn't tell us right away what happened to John after he was arrested, but he circles back to it in chapter 6, near the middle of the gospel, where we learn that Herod had John arrested because John had criticized Herod for the scandal of taking his brother's wife, Herodias, as his own wife. You might remember the soap opera that follows. It ends with John's head on a platter at the pleasure of Herodias and the other guests Herod had invited for a gruesome birthday banquet. Honestly, this sordid tale seems out of place in the gospel, but Mark tells it in order to draw the sharpest possible contrast with what immediately follows it. And what immediately follows is the central story of the gospel, Jesus feeding the 5,000 on the lakeshore. First, Herod, the king of this world, throws a wicked party at his palace for the powerful and the rich, a party that ends in death, because that is what the kingdoms of this world are like. 
Then God throws a party on the lake shore for the poor and the oppressed in which Jesus breaks five loaves of bread and feeds 5,000 people. God's party ends in life, more life, abundant life, enough life for all people because that is what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is a beautiful and, and moving image of where we're headed. But friends, look around. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus claimed the time is fulfilled, and it doesn't seem to be fulfilled yet. I do believe that the world is getting better, but this is an achingly slow process. Poverty and war still menace humanity. The rich still dominate the poor. So what are we to make of this conviction that God's kingdom is here or almost here? And how are we supposed to live in a world that is almost but not yet the way God wants it to be? It seems Paul was also convinced that God's kingdom was coming soon. He begins the passage we heard from his letter to the Corinthians this morning. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. It's the same thing as Jesus saying the time is fulfilled. The point was God's kingdom was any day now going to overthrow the powers of this world. And if that's true, then how are we to live? Paul seems to be measuring the time left in months, maybe a year or two at most. And the advice he gives applies to that short time frame. Let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. He seems to be saying, just hold still because change is coming soon. Now, this would have been particularly difficult advice for the Corinthians. Corinth, in the first century, was a city on the make, a port city, a place of commerce and exchange between Rome in the east and Greece in the west, not unlike San Francisco in some ways. All of those sailors coming in and out of port caused a fair amount of rowdiness, which may explain the problem with prostitutes that we heard Paul talk about a lot last week. These are not people the Corinthians, who wanted to slow down. And yet Paul is trying to give them a vision of another way of being, a better world where their worth would not depend on what they could produce or sell. I don't think they could just stop living their lives, and I don't believe we can do that either. And anyway, things look different when you realize that God's timeline was not one generation or three generations, but 66 generations or so and counting. While that's not long when you consider the age of the universe, it is a long time indeed for individual human beings. Given this much longer time frame, we can't just hold still while we wait for God's kingdom to arrive. But even though Paul got the timing wrong, I don't think he was entirely wrong in what he was saying. I believe his last statement in the passage from this morning is true. The present form of this world is passing away. The present form of this world is passing away. It is always passing away. Consider the change that has happened just in my own lifetime. I was born into a Cold War with the credible threat of nuclear disaster. And then came 1989, and then came 2001, and 2008, and 2016. Each of those years, a turning point marking a world very different from the one that came before. The present form of this world is passing away, so don't get too attached to the way things are, the world as it is. We live in the world, but no particular iteration of the way things are should define our values or what we are living for. Our lives are full of temporal commitments that pull us in many different directions, career, money, power, reputation, nation, church, tribe. But friends, all of those things, everything on that list is passing away. They won't last. We're called to live our lives for deeper values, for eternal values, for God's values, no matter what distractions are happening in the world around us. 
Paul no doubt believed that the end of the world was imminent, but even though it was not, his admonition to let go of the world's values and to live for God's values remains our calling. And even though the end of the Roman Empire did not come about in the way that Paul imagined it, it did come. As biblical scholar Clyde Fant puts it, though no one could see it in Paul's day, imperial Rome was sick unto death. The subversive words of the Galilean were undercutting that monolithic world, cracking apart its foundation like a seed bursting through the smallest crack in the stone. As long as God's values of peace, justice, and love are alive within us, as long as we choose to live our lives by those values and work to build them in the world around us, here, now, today, there is still hope, I believe, that God's kingdom will come on earth as in heaven. Amen.